Okay, I um, guess I'm going to start again streaming over three platforms. I don't know what's on, what's off. Looks like everything is uh, on, so we'll just get started. So, like I said, uh, we were going to jump into um, the history of genomics because uh, when you're taking on something so complicated, you don't really know where to start, so it's always best to start at the beginning. So, historically speaking, we'll go back a little bit in time and we'll talk about hominids, right? And early humans and our ancestors. Um, and apparently, and this is just, um, you know, speculation, but the theory is that our brains got larger as we had more access to protein. And if we think about um, Homo erectus, the first person to walk up straight, we backtrack to an ancestor before that who was basically uh, uh, lucky, on their on their knuckles, dragging their knuckles, uh, hunched over, foraging, and started looking for protein. So protein, I would think, is eggs, right? Eggs was one of the first sources of protein, besides like low sources of protein, like grubs and worms and things like that, or small game. Uh, but uh, eggs, so reaching up towards a tree, right, climbing, and then eggs not being enough, and then looking for larger sources of protein like uh, game, right, like big game. So standing up, looking for game. Uh, this helped this sort of like hunched over ancestor become the first ancestor to walk straight up, Homo erectus. And then as they got more creative, the next um, ancestor was Homo ergaster, uh, the tool user. So we went from, you know, hunched over, crawling on all fours, standing up, and now being able to manipulate things with uh, our, our environment with our hands. So if you look at our earliest ancestor uh, in the ape family, we share 96% of our DNA with chimpanzees. So look at their hands, look at our hands, look at our hands today. So we look at our hands, we're able to type, we're able to text, right? So we go from Homo ergaster to Homo sapiens and then Homo sapiens sapiens. So our ancestor, an ancestor who's capable of thought, we are now capable to think about thought. So that's where we are today, okay? So what happened? Like what, what made... Uh, this change, right? As we were impacted by our environment looking for larger sources of protein, we actually, um, you know, it influenced how our body works. So our hands look like how they look like now because we use tools and we started walking straight because we were looking for sources of protein. Now, I'm not uh, an anthropologist nor am I an evolutionary biologist, but I think it's safe to say that in, um, environment impacts right, how a species uh, develops. And in that is written to the next generation in the DNA, right? That's inheriting traits and genes. So when we talk about genetics, we're talking about one gene, the ability to stand up straight, one gene, the ability to use our hands, okay? And the father of modern genetics would be Gregor Mandel, who was uh, a monk, uh, and he was a contemporary of Darwin, right? Okay, so... Uh, I know Darwin is a, a controversial figure, but uh, if there's an issue with Darwin, you may not really care for the rest of this lecture. But going forward, uh, Gregor Mendel was looking at genes, right? His pea plants, tall ones, short ones, small leaf, broad leaf, and he would breed these. And this was, you know, the early science of genetics and be, being able to track genes, one specific gene, one specific trait. So if you want to think about genetics and you want to define the term genetics in your own mind, Look at dogs, right? Dogs are humanity's uh, genetic playground, as I like to, to call it, right? Look at a chihuahua, look at like a teacup uh, Yorkie, and then look at uh, the uh, Great Dane, right? And all the animals in between, right? Hair, color, function, shepherds, pointers, hounds, working dogs, shepherding, like all of these are traits that were desirable, selective breeding, right? Look at our food, our food didn't, doesn't look the same way as our ancestors did. But if we look at this, we see that we are tracing one gene. Now, that's Gregor Mendel, and that's genetics. Now, what Darwin inadvertently had done is studied evolution in, in the sense that, like, um, how does the environment impact the, the species? So how does the environment kind of influence the genome, the gene code, the DNA, right? the gene uh, uh, 
the blueprint, right? How does it influence? So uh, by studying the crossbill wrench, the crossbill wrench was a bird that had like a crooked beak. And he started looking at that bird in comparison to other birds that had normal beaks. But this beak was like this. And why was it? He was looking at how this actual creature was accessing food. Its mouth was developed to open certain pods to access seed. And as it did it over time, that normal beak kind of, you know, changed shape over time. And as that bill changed over time, it was inherited by uh, its offsprings, which then became another creature. So to sum it all up, take a look at a giraffe, right? Why is the giraffe's neck so long? Maybe its ancestors was competing for like other leaves amongst other animals at the time and wasn't finding or wasn't accessing it. So it started stretching for higher sources uh, of uh, leaves or different types of leaves, just like our ancestors started climbing trees and looking for tall game. Its neck started to elongate and it impacted the, the you know, how this trait and how it was inherited by its ancestors to become a giraffe today, the crossbill wrench, the human being, right? How is this environment shaped? So why am I talking about that? Because we need to sort of make a distinction between genetics, genomics, right? And then epigenomics and epigenetics, right? So uh, if we look at the genome, right, we're saying that we have, we're looking at one gene. Genetics is one gene. Genomics is looking at the whole genome and saying, okay, there's the gene for the long neck of the giraffe. There's the gene for diabetes, curly hair, red hair, freckles, green eyes, all that stuff. That's genetics. Genomics is looking at it all the way down, taking the DNA out and looking and finding exactly where that trait is. Okay. Epigenomics, okay, is how that gene turns on and off. Like how the gene turn on to create a long neck or, or in the case of like not fixed, like your hair color or your eye color and things like that, we're looking at disease, right? Epigenomics is really how does the cancer gene turn on? How does diabetes turn on? Okay. And uh, how does uh, cardiovascular disease turn on over time? And then epigenetics is what turns those genes on and off, okay? Environmental factors. So if we backtrack a little bit, we talk about uh, Gregor Mendel, we talk about genetics, we talk about traits, right? And we parallel him with Darwin. Darwin is saying like, you have this code, you have this gene, right? Uh, Gregor is saying you have these genes and you can inherit these, these characteristics. But what Darwin is saying is like, these traits develop as an outcome of your environment. Like nature, versus nurture okay so your nature what you're born with is your dna your code your blueprint your genome your genes nurture is environment access to food uh things like that right how does it impact you so when i talk about uh, to break it down and try to remember or the impact i say genomics is who so who are we talking about the crossbill red winch finch are we talking about the giraffe are we talking about ourselves right how is referred to genomic so we can look at these traits these genes these diseases and see how they work on the genome or find them directly on the genome epigenomically see how it turns i see how the disease turns on or how these genes activate and then epigenetics is what what turns these on what turns these genes on and off? So uh, one of the early scientists who kind of came up with the spirals helix model, and now you'll, you'll be surprised, okay? Because I know this is very exciting information for you, and I know everybody's going, you know, crazy about what we're learning here. But let me tell you, the field of genetics and genomics, the history of it, is, is very controversial, starting with Darwin and what people thought about him, right? But let's talk about Watson and Crick. Okay, Watson and Crick were the first scientists who basically came up with the, the double helix model of the DNA. Now, they couldn't find, right, they were talking in terms of genes. They were looking for genes or models of genes. But they had, we hadn't reached genomics yet, so we couldn't find these genes. But we had this sort of model of what um, DNA looks like. And then we'll, next time we'll talk about, um, 
you know, terminology about all these things that we're, we're discussing. So, um, and we'll backtrack some stuff, but basically Watson and Craig came up with the model and Watson was of the school who said that you are basically a blueprint and a dest and destined to follow uh, um, your genetic code and there's no escaping it. So if grandma had diabetes, you have diabetes. If your dad had diabetes, you get diabetes. There's no way of avoiding it. But now we know the type two diabetes is avoidable with diet, right? We know that. So why did Watson, uh, at least we're not correct, but Watson, why did he dominate this thought of like, uh, why do we go to the doctor's office and fill out our family history, right? We're looking for prevention. We want to know what's coming down the pike, but it doesn't necessarily mean. So when you do a genomic test and you find some sort of disease, it doesn't mean that that's your, your, your fate. That's the end of it. But the established science for a long time was that Watson, because he was, you know, a very pompous British person, one of his counterparts, Wilson, was saying that, no, there is an influence to the environment, to on the genome, on the impact of disease, on the impact of traits and things like that. Um, you know, but because uh, Watson was such a pompous jerk, right, his voice was silenced. He, he had no influence in the sphere of the science of genetics, which basically crippled and paralyzed this field of epigenetics. So if we were thinking about environment back when the model of the genome of the, of um, you know, the double helix came out, you know, we would have impacted medicine as it is, but we're saying this person's voice was silenced. But not only that, Watson was also known to have uh, taken, um, you know, uh, material from one of his female counterparts, just silent silencing her voice. If anybody's wondering why there's not more women in STEM, that's because of people like uh, Watson, right? There's no shortage of stories out there about a woman discovering something and then some, uh, some man stepping on her toes. So, with that being said, some some person like this with this personality basically took over and shaped the field of genomic science or molecular bi biology or genetic science and basically said that this is the nail in the coffin. You have this gene and it's over. But now uh, George Church was one of the first scientists who decoded the genome. And once he did that, and once we achieved this amazing sort of computing power, we were able to calculate and find and assign traits, find genes. And now as we get more and more advanced, we're finding out that there's more things out there that are influencing the genes. So you could, you could look at like something like eye color and say, uh, okay, well, you know, that's a fixed trait or your hair texture or your hair color. But, you know, we know darker hair, brown hair, people in the sun sometimes bleach. Right? How does the hair change color like that? Uh, we know there's certain pharmaceuticals. I think it's uh, Latisse or something like that. So in order to uh, make uh, longer eyelashes, this drug actually changes your eye color. So think about that. Think about the epigenetic effect of that pharmaceutical in order to lengthen your eyelashes will actually change your eye color. So something fixed can be moved like that. So think about something like underlying diseases, right? Like what if I have, I, I know personally, I have, um, I have uh, diabetes, I have cardiovascular disease, I have uh, prostate uh, conditions, right? Not ashamed to talk about that because, you know, if anybody else uh, knows anything about uh, prostate issues, it's definitely something serious. It's, uh, it's one of the top uh, killers. But so three out of my four grandparents died or had a, a, a ischemic event, had a, um, uh, a stroke. Uh, one of them dodged a bullet. My father has high blood pressure. My mother has high blood pressure. Uh, I, what did I do? I did a, um, I did a test. I went on to uh, 23andMe. I uh, got a report. I immediately took that report and uploaded it to the Prometheus, the global genetic database. And let me tell you something. That was a lot of fun, right? Finding out about all my genes. But, 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 but with everything else out there, if I know that I have diabetes, heart disease, uh, and prostate issues in my family history, right? Like Gregor Mandel, tra you know, tracing these traits, I could take a little bit from Darwin and say, hey, you know what? Maybe don't eat like a schmuck, right? Don't eat like a jerk. Clean up your diet, right? Lay off all the 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 mass marketed agro industrial foods like beef and meat and all of these things out there and maybe stick to a plant-based diet because i said this before in the previous lecture like we all know that a plant-based diet is the way to go it does influence you uh it does is is generally healthier you know it's not a controversial statement here 
So somebody like me now has the proof in the pudding. We, we, we tracked it through Gregor Mendel and we said, uh, okay, well, you know, we know mom and dad and grandparents all have these conditions. We did a genomic report. We put it up on 23andMe and got a report. We went a step further and we put it on the global database and we actually found the genes, right, on paper, not, you know, on the genome itself, but now we can track it and know. And then instead of like freaking out, oh my God, I'm going to have a heart attack. I'm going to have a stroke. I'm going to have diabetes. Uh, I will fine tune my diet. I'm in the health field, right? I have no excuse. I should be prepared for my fate. So with that being said, I, I hope I was able to sort of like give you a timeline over how we got to where we are today. And I know it's a lot of information and I recommend that everybody uh, hello, Danny Drew. Thanks for the wave. Um, thank you uh, for listening. Thank you for tuning in. So we we know we have this sort of like crystal ball, right? We have this path. We have a roadmap to our future. We don't have to freak out. We know what's coming down the pike. We can prepare for it. We're in the health field, at least, or, or at least I am, and I should, you know, be responsible for my own outcome. And I I uh, will will take these measures. Yeah, do I have benders? Do I like to eat and stuff like that? Sure, but at the end of the day, in the back of my mind, it's like, do I want to end up with uh, you know a stroke where I can't use my tongue or I can't move or I can't get out of bed, right? Do I really want to be uh, injecting or taking medication and pharmaceuticals to control my diabetes, right? No, I don't want that. So for me, what I'm going to do with my, by the way, always check in with your primary care physician, get checked out once a year, do a blood test, follow and track these in real time, see what's going on with your blood sugar, cholesterol, um, all, and, and all these panels. It's very, very important to see your primary doctor. Uh, there's no shortage of specialists in the United States and we spend a lot of money on healthcare, but we could reduce that by just checking in every once in a while and planning ahead. And I hope that's what we can take away today is say that, you know, we have the science, we can use it. People have been trying to figure out for a while, but at this point, we, we have the keys of the kingdom. We have the proof in the pudding. We have the crystal ball. We have the roadmap, right? And that's why I'm pushing genomics, right? Prevention, prevention, prevention. See your doctor, get a blood test, but also think about doing a genomic report. Should you decide to do that, feel free to reach out. We can walk you through it. It could be a little frightening. It could be a little bit scary. We can find genes for cancer. But what what one of the one of the greatest things about genomic science is like, why treat cancer at stage four, right? Why wait for it to blow up in our face? If the average age of, of breast cancer in this country is 62, right? And unfortunately we have a grandma has passed away from it. Mom is in treatment right now. What if her younger daughter was able to do a test and find, does it mean to freak out? No, absolutely not. What it means is that you can monitor it in, in conjunction with your primary care physician, with your gynecologist, you can keep track of it. You can change your diet. You can move away. I tell my patient, move away from the, the, the nuclear power plant, you know, drink the, the clean water and tune up the diet and get the exercise and do all the good things that we know help, right? It's all out there. The information's out there. But again, if you're thinking about exploring this journey, please feel free to reach out. I can at least help you navigate it or get to the right point. But I've been looking into this for quite a bit and I, I have a pretty solid handle on it and uh, we can we can definitely navigate it together. So uh, prevention, prevention, prevention. See your primary care physician. Think about getting a genomic report. And if you need anything, it's overwhelming, you don't understand, please, please, please feel free to reach out and we can go over it together, okay? Uh, thanks for tuning in. The follow up discussion will be terminology. Uh, so if you have any co uh, colicky infants or active, overactive children, please feel free to put this on in the background. I will definitely be more than glad to bore them to sleep. Uh, but uh, I hope everybody found this to be as exciting as I find it. If not, next time you need to go to sleep or you have problems uh, going to bed, uh, put on the background. Feel free to use it for your insomnia. I hope my... Uh, my, hey, what's up, Bobby? Any fires to put out today? Um, uh, my mellifluous voice will talk you to sleep. At the very least, if you if you find this little information overwhelming, uh, feel free to use it for a, uh, a cure for insomnia. So with that being said, uh, signing off. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, also, since my buddy Bobby's on there, if you guys like red wine, everybody knows that red wine has Reservatrol. It's good for uh, longevity and health. It's in the Blue Zone diet. Check out Beer Vino show at 12 o'clock uh, about the wine show. It is fantastic. 
Uh, I know everybody makes a big deal about um, French wines or California wines, but let me tell you, there is some great sleeper wines in the Italian selection. Uh, I, 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 I highly recommend the show at Beer Vino, 12 o'clock on Fridays. Uh, they've also been an inspiration for me to get back on and, and stream more. So I want to thank everybody. And uh, I'll see you probably on Monday and we'll talk about terminology, right? Thank you.